Thank you so much for being prepared to listen to this this way. Um, it's a real pity. I'd, I'd hoped for us to interact in person. Um, this is a topic that means a lot to me and I'm trying to negotiate it. And it would have really been wonderful to engage in person in discussion in informal ways. I hope though that um, listening to this recording, roughly thrown together as it is, um, and engaging together or if you're doing it um, synchronously, I'm not quite sure what your setup is, will still be valuable. Um, of course, it goes without saying that I hope you're managing in the chaos that this virus has brought to us um, as within your families and your personal life, as well as in the university life. I'm going to now um, put on my um, rather large um, children's headsets because it's St. Patrick's Day here, so I should be um, interacting with them, but I've taken a few moments in the morning to record this for you. I'm going to put this on and, and switch off my camera and um, engage with the slides and then I, there's a movie um, at the end that I'm hoping that you will watch and I will be available throughout the recorded time and the discussion time afterwards um, for um, live uh, social media correspondence as you go forward. But thank you. Against a backdrop of increasing strife, dis-ease and uncertainty expressed by students and academics within higher education in many places across the globe, critical university studies have seen a distinct re-emergence. This talk presents a number of reflections in an attempt to productively question our engagement with this field within the academy, clues of which are embedded within the discord I've suggested in the title. Advance is a sense of the agency of those of us within to shape the field and be shaped by it, and the currents and imaginaries to which such movement relates. Counter relates to resistance, to a concern with whom and what is counted as important in and for this area of inquiry, and whom or what can effectively counter the dominant and the oppressive within and about higher education. It relates to the politics and geopolitics of this field and its internal pressures of legitimation, delegitimation, as it becomes disciplined into a discipline. Against this to and fro discord of countering to advance are observations, which I've included to situate this talk within my particular perspective, concerns and positionality about the traditions, the trajectories, the openings of this area of inquiry and the potential in its ways of operating. Firstly, I'd like us to find some common ground about the area of study and what it is at the moment before speaking of the undercurrents to which I am drawn and which I hope you'll find of interest to your own way of thinking, your research or your practice. I could map the field in a sort of neutral way, but I think that would be disingenuous because I have an agenda, a burden of responsibility and of course, ideological leanings that pull me inevitably to what I believe is my work. It is for you to see where there may be parallels or divergences or even disruptions of your own. When mapping the field, I'd like to stress that the question perhaps should rather be with a field that's been around for a long time before the mainstream of the UK or the EU or the US. What is, why is it re-emerging as something to be and be seen doing at this time. So what is critical So what is critical university studies? I guess one could argue the obvious, that it's the study of universities, inclusive of the more contemporary higher education and the older academy guild. I personally think it should also be about the study of the study of universities and the effects of such study, operative criticism of how such a field operates towards informing and changing the peoples and structures. In broad sweeps, one could state that as a critical orientation, critical university studies, the consideration and analysis of power, privilege, and authority. 
focusing on the production of the discursive fields of stasis, reproduction, and change or transformation. And this includes the agents, the players, the history, the frames of reference, etc. This is important because critical university studies has often emerged as an area where there's been a threat to what is, was, or should be. And for me, this is where there are great divergences in how critical university studies is understood and handled by those of different orientations and interests at the moment. Interwoven in current debates in different parts of the globe are the constructions of academic freedom, academic and institutional autonomy, and their relations to the clump together understandings of the impact of neoliberalist forces but also the persistence of colonialist, imperialist assessment regimes and the imposition of oppression at various levels of the academy. The power relations inherent to knowledge structures and knowledge formations, its organization, disciplines and disciples, including its knowers. Within this are the mechanics of authority and power within the knowledge generation processes research subjects, objects, topics, and trends, such as the politics of knowledge and academic publishing. The social formation and structure of the university. Social formation at the level of the microcurriculum, the construction of students and their ideal and inverse, teachers and other designations, the meso curriculum, such as academic development, academic citizenry, management, administration, champions, leaders, institutional cultures. The macro curriculum with its disciplinary formations, geopolitics of the higher education sector, its agents and consumers and publics within higher education. Included within this would be the construction of professional and academic identities, academic and non-academic relations, university engagement, etc. And then the relationship between the university, community and society, which of course involves both social formation and knowledge formation, but also debates about the university's purpose, most often outlined in the issue of its good or goods, the public good versus private good debate, the social good, but also the common good more recently with the growth in the commons and the sustainable development goals. You'll see from this messy picture that the focus or the foci of critical university studies are not new. Within those who have addressed it would fall to my mind those with an interest in the hidden curriculum, whether in terms of the tacit, the implicit, the unconscious or the insidious of the micro curriculum of teaching and learning, whether the meso curriculum of the conditions of identity formation, the politics of belonging, misrecognition, performance, norms, values within the university, and the hidden curriculum of the macro curriculum of how society engineers its subjects through such institutional or state apparatus. Some of the traditions of adult learning, particularly the humanist and the critical tradition, and the latter's offshoot, the postmodernisms of resistance. Think only of the resurgence in these traditions from Giraud, etc., but Bell Hooks, of course, would be there, Paulo Freire, the greats inspire collective action of resistance to oppressive structures through education. And then there is the humanities project. And this overlaps, of course, with aspects of the latter. <laughs> There's nothing unmessy about these relations. The humanities project sees itself emerge in different parts of the world and questions the university, figures of authority and their relation to our being and our frames though it should be noted that often the project has been problematic in its positioning of whom our is and we is, and arguably was about the violence of con the constructions of knowledges and peoples in relations to the myth of progress, quality, purity, and their dichotomies, and the collusion with power, fascism, capitalism, etc. So leading off and against that current has been resistance to such notions. The attack on the ivory tower, the call for equality and more so for equity, and more recently the call to respond to geopolitics development and the sustainable development goals. 
And indeed, many of us are questioning the institution's fitful purpose of this mandate to drive that project. But it is older. The recognition of the colonial and Christian projects of the Eurocentric university, the wrestling with the settler colonial university, modernity, coloniality linkages, abolitionist and other movements, and the relation to concerns with a neoliberal university rising from the ruins. Within and beyond this, because of course there are universities and movements beyond the Eurocentric, are of course student politics and protests, which are a huge indication of wider societal discontent, massive need for change against injustice, and the realization of the freedoms of the campus space as incubation and expression of divergent thought from the status quo. Then there is the work, position and power of the unions, labor, class, also the global and local tensions of the institution, global, global capital. Also with law and policy, looking at regulation and governance, such as assessment regimes, committees, funding allocation, their processes and hierarchies. And through that bureaucracy and systemic injustice, and here the influence of critical legal studies and critical race theory has been strongly felt in this field. Civic, democratic, political, social good of the university, higher education for social justice or remedying the ills of society, the institution as critical consciousness, some say for democracy, but that may be too narrow a definition. Rather, perhaps the institution is one of moral authority in societies, as with the judiciary, the independent press, artists, not only during explicit conflict and oppression, but also in relation to the systemic, the hidden, the everyday. I'll come back to that later. As you can see, critical university studies is an umbrella term for broad areas of inquiry, and it will necessarily be different in different contexts because it emerges from a need and in response to the needs of context. It is certainly not a field or a discipline yet, which makes it exciting and rich to form and inform, but also often precarious. There are questions about the future prospects of those who study within such a space. And I guess this has been the case for those who engage in those centers or areas of inquiry, which have grown from attempts to address problematics such as women's studies, gender studies, in other contexts, African studies or Dalit studies. This precarity is doubly weighted in critical university studies because the study is about the very organization and apparatus of which it is a part and which funds, gives employment, promotions, and also is increasingly risk averse, especially when it comes to reputation and branding. But there are enough indications to be able to claim that the university and universities have rarely in their past been invested in self-study, critique, or even evaluating their own practices, policies, or discourses. Even in spaces where higher education and evaluation is given prominence from the government, ministries, or vice chancellors, or through centers established to disrupt and educate in this area, such as my own country of South Africa, where I was shaped. It's difficult to affect such work and to sustain it because of the emotional toil and professional risks, but also because institutional resistance to research of itself and to that research leading to impacting in change is perhaps not in the interest of those in power. This quotation emerged in a study I'm currently undertaking with two collaborators, Dr. Nandita Dalwan of Jodhpur University and Dr. Grace Eseosa Idahosa of University of Johannesburg. A participant was speaking about the resistance to critique of higher education as something sacrosanct, the very top level of society. It is such an aesthetic of purity it continues to intrigue me about the education of fine artists, for instance, the most creative, the most close to notions of the divine or unteachable. And it is also that which intrigues me about our notions of quality and excellence that are interwoven within higher education. 
But this person was specifically talking about the resistance to critical study of the university as interference, as traitorous within the Indian context. He was talking about resistance to evaluating the impact of policies and practices designed to change institutional dynamics for academic women and for those from marginalized scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, but also a far right push about what is right about inequality in higher education. The idiom has much weight in current India with a saffronization of higher education as it's called, the Brahminical and Hindutva purity and attack on those others, particularly Muslims for eating meat, the cow, is being evoked here. Why I both fear and like this quotation is that it also relates to the nostalgia that many feel for the universities of the past within critical university studies. I have found nostalgia a very strong constant within what claims the term critical university studies in the UK. There seems a strong link with those in the US whom perhaps are fatigued with a concern with difference, particularly race in that context and have over pushed the line towards neoliberalism as an erosion of what was once beautiful from previous notions of the Eurocentric university. I'd just like to say that, of course, there is much UK research and work that falls outside of critical university studies that centers systemic injustice and markers of difference. But I think it is their relationship that worries me and that there seems a strong current that doesn't wrestle with the issue of justice and the problematic foundations of higher education. We could draw on Sharon Stain here, who talks about what we need to relinquish of our institutions and of their reflected glory by association, as they die around us of the grandiose dream I worry that the nostalgia is from those who only see the threat and not the full histories of the university in their ugly complexity, remaining enamored perhaps by an aesthetic of whiteness in its fullest sense, but also willfully ignorant to the connections and active pursuits of those universities in domination and destruction across the world, and also in in each institution's own time and place. There seems in some quarters a resistance to seeing the push for access within massification, in teaching as emancipatory, in diversity work and gender work as potentially disruptive, and moreover, a lack of support for keeping those projects radical. I feel here strongly that there should be an opening of the eyes and to not see the past, especially now when universities are doing similar things in the present, to not see that is to pretend that the violences of what is being lumped with neoliberal forces are in some way new. This is not new. The critical studies of universities and now more broadly higher education are not new. To claim this is to deny the many currents of resistance to its power and claims to authority wherever it was planted, to neglect to see the consequences of both the applied and pure operations of the university, and is to my mind, unethical. What does emerge across the many currents of critical university studies is that of the critical, where critique is important and of value, and perhaps due to the applied nature and the personal histories of its researchers, where there is a distaste with business as usual and critique for its own sake, which is seen as lacking. Also, where critique and conflict are seen as generative, with with disruption underpinned by conflict theory as necessary for structural change, and where often there is self-critique, doubt, vigilance against privilege and stasis, and a concerned push against the machinations of oppression. And perhaps this is where my own operations differ so greatly from those expressed in the re-emergence of critical university studies here in the UK. And then also, of course, the importance of critical in terms of what I'm doing now, critique of a field, to study the studies of a particular area and to worry about its operations, its impact for the current 
and future university. Part of the title of this talk is the question of whether it is necessary to counter to advance. It is not possible to my mind to be in this field without having a double consciousness of misfit. Really, how can one not when you're an insider to the site of one's study and of the machinery of which one is a part is shaped by and shapes. In a recent talk I gave as part of a colloquium in Calcutta last month, I spoke about renegade intellectuals, not to suggest a rebel. I think academics have spent so long submitting to assessment, marks, review and hoops that very few of us have our remnants of rebellion within. But renegade is suitable because it's a term for those who have lost faith in something that they once believed to be of such purpose and they've become aware and then move about restless, bothered and bothering, looking for what works, less precious about their dis discipline or the mythologies of the institution or their titles or the way they know, a little more courageous to sacrifice career goals and accolades to move against the grain. There are those within certain disciplines who are more assertive in this regard, those who are mandated officers to do this work and activists. But there are many in other disciplines too, those in human rights, development studies, cultural studies, even those from spaces one would not imagine. Many of us have some sort of faith, as this quote alludes. In the university, despite all we see and know, but not for our jobs necessarily, our careers, or even our disciplines, but for that fundamental sense of our work in this world, or in a more just present or future. I agree with the academic who made the statement when asked about what sustainability for transformation within higher education was to him. It is about the faith we have in our work, for me, a way to advance is solidarity with other renegades and this work. In response to the often dire state of affairs that critical university studies reveals of injustice, alienation, despair, and what I often feel is a suturing of possibility, I find myself turning to a terrain I know little of, attempting to answer the question for myself and others how do we find faith? A possible way to find faith is what I have just alluded to, which is the scholars, the intellectuals, the practitioners who may be the renegades within. And then there are those who feel the burden. I use the image of the pen here to explain this. The pen is mightier than the sword is the English idiom. But as you can see, it has been evoked over time and across spaces. In the wake of great historical trauma, renegotiating representation is an exceptionally important process for truth seeking, reflection and memorialization. I'm influenced by the Jewish scholars who have well theorized these issues, but you know many others. Not all of this will occur in the university. It is also the burden of the artist and the reality that one cannot do justice to that lost in the past and in the present is there too. I've termed this historical melancholia, the weight of that burden of representation, but also the weight of the obligation to persevere in the face of the impossible. So recognizing the many in our societies who share historical melancholia, the artists, the philosophers, the poets may be a way through. This is not a dominant narrative within the MISO curriculum which shapes our academic identity in most current higher education systems, but many bear the weight of the agency of the pen. I see recognition and fostering of this as a way through the ugly realities which I believe critical university studies should bring to light. I've seen it with those who have lived through the violence of the university culture industries. I feel it myself. But I learn most in terms of faith from the first generation academics and the Syrian academics 
who feel the burden. When I last met with Syrian academics in exile in June in Istanbul, thanks to the Council of At-Risk Academics and my collaborator Tom Parkinson of Kent, some were demonstrably driven to distraction about this burden. What were they to do? They have so little support for their academic practice, but whom else could be trusted to look after, complexly comprehend, research, speak for, look forward, back for their communities, than those people who were or are the academics of Syria. Of course, they're ignored because there is no protection when you're a terrorist according to your country, even if your country's regime is seen as illegitimate in international communities. But when there is really no protection outside of academia, from the margin, the exile bears witness. I believe we can learn much about hope in the academic project when the academic is stripped bare, when all the institutional authority, prestige, status, protection, and that funding, which has schooled and constrained and diverted our attention most of all, remove that, what remains? What do those fallen out of favor or dethroned, those retired or independent, those migrant, in exile or displaced, what does their drive tell us? particularly those in the face of trauma, eroded protection, great injustice, or state authoritarianism. There is the academic, the intellectual. There is the hope for the hopeless, as they are both the hopeless too, but carry with them knowledge and the power to still represent, to teach, to learn, and that cannot be stripped of them. Similarly, in many contexts, such as the continent from where I come, where universities have both responsibility and create possibility, and where they must serve because there is little alternative. For me, this is hope for the hopeless, a term from Theodore Donner, talking about the ethical obligation to the other, alive, dead within ourselves, which must compel us in our work. And then there is what happens with large scale change and the possibility it creates. The project of access has been one with such rapid large scale change and it is still occurring in much of the world, particularly those transitioning from low participation contexts. This is a tough one because in some national contexts, systemic ways have been formulated to stratify whom of these newcomers get to have power as teaching institutions are used to divert them away from the formation of knowledge where real power is sought. Similarly, many institutions diversify their staff for tick box processes, beginning and ending transformation at their hiring, and not creating the conditions for substantive change nor powerful participation. Also, in this present moment, access can easily be co-opted into globalization drives and a new normal comes about. After all, internalization, enculturation, and reproduction is inherent to much education. But I hold much hope for the full heterogeneity when there is a mass that can protect each other and foster cultural change. I've seen it within first-generation students and first-generation academics in South Africa. I think they can be just conceptions of academic identities. I've engaged with critical university studies in conventional research outputs, and these are available online. And I've attempted through them to engage in the standard ways that one tries to inform change, briefings, presentations to committees, workshops, etc. But I'd like to end by touching on a recent project that I've embarked on to create counter stories against the dominant narratives of higher education, short films in collaboration with Analog Eye Video Art Africa. You'll see I have a link below for you to engage with individually and I hope you'll have time to go through a few of them. I'm not sure if there are any folks listening who were part of the virtual talk that I gave two years ago for Frank's class, but you can see that this is an offshoot of the website, the Higher Education Arts Archive, 
which holds links to movies, art, literature, and other texts that are not dispassionate, but are about the lived experiences of higher education. I began this project to try to address the issue of concept conceptual impact of research of higher education and also authorship, of a need to explore ways of critique, a generative, exploratory, messy, complex. And these works hold a sense of the immense knowledge and wisdom which being an insider outsider gave to these participants, all first generation academics. I don't see this as a romanticization or a neo-colonialist drive, nor hero narratives of people as somehow exceptional to their backgrounds or communities, but rather more about creating an imaginary to advance. It's a pilot project, and so you're encouraged to respond to the links at the bottom and share it widely so that we, by this I mean part the participants, the artists and the researchers, can analyse its value. If you click on the link that um, will take you to the website, uh, you could have a look at any form and you can look at it from any device. Um, I encourage you to share it and, and give your feedback. But I was thinking for, for this engagement, um, it would maybe be best if we have a look at the bell. If you click on the bell, you can see that I've given a, a short, very, very short narrative description that is um, in an attempt not to guide the reading of the work too much, which is a concern of the artists, that it is an experience that people can bring their own understandings to as they engage with it. And you will see that at the bottom, there is a, a link that says you record your response. I would so appreciate responses to that because that is what we are collecting over time through engagements and workshops and will feed back to the artists, but also the academics who participated in this project. Um, so I'm going to ask that um, this recording is paused now. Um, Frank, if you can jump in. And then if you can play the bell, um, either within the room or together, or if this is asynchronously, if you can link to it. And um, thank you for listening. I hope that it was interesting for you and has been productive for your thinking of whether we need to counter to advance. And I welcome your comments and questions as we continue to engage online.